Breaking tonight in the years before Sayed Farouk and his wife committed mass murder, Farouk was heavily involved in a mosque in Riverside, California. And perhaps no one there knew him better than the center's director. Earlier, he spoke to us about the man he knew before Syed Farouk married Tashfeen Malik, and the pair turned into killers. This is the mosque Saeed Farouk attended from 2012 to 2014. He and its director were very close, discussing everything from Islam to Saeed's love life. When he decided to get married, probably he started some contact through the Internet with a young woman in Saudi Arabia. She is from a Pakistani origin. He was born in America, and she was born overseas, and she lived overseas. So that was one of the... Uh, one of his concerns that he, uh, he spoke to me about. Saeed asked for Dr. Kuko's blessing. Kuko says he gave it, but with a caution. Check on her background, check on her family background, things like that. That was what he spoke about, I remember. You know. Kuko says he only remembers one time Saeed's wife, Tafshin Malik, attended the mosque. And shortly thereafter, Saeed stopped attending. After he got married, uh, also he uh, started, uh, he continued to coming to our mosque for almost like, I would say, three months or so. And then after that, he stopped coming because he moved into, he moved out of Riverside into Redlands. And uh, I understand that I uh, started going to uh, some mosque over that area. When he heard Saeed was behind Wednesday's deadly attack, Kuko says he was shocked. I said, of all, I was in a state of disbelief because I know the guy. How come he can do something like this, something like that? But uh, it, is, uh, it, it was, was, was awful. Kuko says the man he knew seemed incapable of committing mass murder. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to rectify uh, those two things. You know, someone who's so quiet and peaceful and, and someone who has... Uh, you know, the audacity to commit such a uh, horrendous crime. He also says Saeed never told him about any office conflict. He never told me about anything that relates to work problems. As for his wife's reported pledge of allegiance to ISIS? I'm not sure about this report, and I haven't seen it, and I, I have no way of saying it's, uh, it's, uh, it's true or false. Joining me now, Brad Thor, former member of the Homeland Security Department's analytic red cell unit and best-selling author of Code of Conduct. Brad, thanks for being here. You're so welcome. now we have it coming together. He goes to the mosque, he leaves, he goes to a different mosque, and meantime, we find out uh, that his wife is pledging allegiance to ISIS before they walk into that conference room, and the latest reporting is, guess what? There was no argument between this guy and his coworkers on the morning he shot them to death. Right. We would have heard about that long ago. And I'll tell you, this is the first time I'm hearing this interview with the director of his previous mosque in Riverside. And one of the things that immediately popped into my head, Megan, is what if the wife radicalized him? Mm -hmm. What if this woman from Pakistan who grew up in Saudi Arabia and came over here, what if she was the force behind making him a more pious Muslim and pushed him in this direction? Because... I'm finding it hard to put together in my head that he could get her trained up and passionate enough to commit to this kind of attack. We, won't, we may never know, but boy, isn't that an interesting supposition, potentially. What, what is your understanding of what we're doing when it comes to mosques in America right now? Well, I'll tell you, I, I have to compare what we're doing against the French. Uh, the French are very, very... I'll use the word liberal, but it's not the right way to do it. They, they will put wire, they'll do wiretapping, they'll do all sorts of stuff, microphones in mosques, they want to record all the sermons. I think about what the NYPD did with their, uh, Commissioner Kelly, with the demographics unit that Bill de Blasio didn't like, as far as, you know, they'd have to have probable cause, but they wouldn't let things stop at the threshold of a mosque if they thought there was planning going inside. And traditionally, the mosque is more than just a house of worship. You can store things there, you can plant things there, happens in the Middle East. We've even got rules of engagement that allows us to go into mosques in the Middle East for our military. So this, I don't think we're doing enough here. I, I, you know, listen, I'm a big guy about civil liberties. I know you, you respect them, particularly as an attorney, but we have to find that right balance between security and, uh, and liberty in this country. And if we get a lead that stuff's going on in a mosque and hate's being preached or jihad is being encouraged, I think that ought to be enough probable cause to go to a judge for a warrant to start doing more aggressive surveillance on that mosque. Mm -hmm. It opens up as... 
a dicey, you know, area though. Illegally. Well, I don't think but, the Catholics, the Amish, the Protestants. It's not like we got a problem across the board religion-wise. Well, it's interesting I, I you should raise that point. Thing. Interesting you should raise that point because this is this is contrary to the point raised by the attorneys for the family.